Bonjour! Our third and last lesson of Acts 18. This is New Testament video 385, Acts lesson 61. As we began Acts 18 with six verses, so we conclude the chapter with six verses. Dear Heavenly Father, may we grow up in the scriptures rightly divided, move out of spiritual kindergarten and into Grace University and beyond. Thank you for this chance to learn, develop, perfect our understanding that we may better appreciate what you are doing and what you will do in and through us. In the name of Jesus Christ, thank you. Amen. Acts chapter 18, 28 verses, read verses 1 through 28, the whole chapter with me. Acts 18 verse 1, after these things Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila born in Pontus, lately come from Italy, with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them, and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence, verse 7, and entered into a certain man's house named Justus. One that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace. For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. For I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, or Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat, saying, This fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, Look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. 
And Gallio cared for none of those things. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while, and then took his leave of the brethren, and sailed thence into Syria, and with him Priscilla and Aquila, having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. And he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not, but bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. But I will return again unto you, if God will. And he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea, and gone up, and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. Our current study, verse 23. And after he had spent some time there, he departed, and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia, in order strengthening all the disciples. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, or Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the Scriptures that Jesus was Christ. A short chapter. We have the final six verses to tackle. We will review our last two studies of Acts 18 first. For the context, Acts 18, 1. Paul, going from Athens, westward to Corinth. His ministry in Corinth. This is the final part of Paul's second apostolic, not missionary, apostolic journey. Here in Acts 18. In Corinth. Acts 18. Verse 2. Paul found a certain Jew named Aquila. Born in Pontus, northern Turkey. Lately come from Italy. Just immigrated from Rome. With his wife Priscilla. Because that Claudius and that's Roman Emperor Claudius Caesar, had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome. He expelled them. He banished them from Rome. Paul meets them in Corinth, this husband and wife. Verse 3, he was of the same craft, so he stayed with them, he lived with them. Three tent makers, Paul, Aquila, 
and Aquila's wife Priscilla. Tent makers. Verse 4. Paul reasoned in the synagogue of Corinth every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, that would be northern Greece, Paul and Aquila and Priscilla are in southern Greece. Paul was pressed in the Spirit 5, and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. He is encouraged to speak up. Six, and when they, that would be the Jews in the synagogue of Corinth, opposed themselves and blasphemed, contradicted, spoke against Paul, refusing to believe his message, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. I've warned you. You've closed your ears. You've closed your eyes. You've closed your hearts. I can't do anything for you. That is apostate Israel outside of Palestine. The blindest person is the one who refuses to see. The deafest person is the one who refuses to hear. And the foolhardiest person is the one who refuses to believe. That's something I made up. <laughs> How applicable even now. <laughs> it was true 2,000 years ago. It's applicable today. Valid today. Same sin nature. Same Lord God. Same satanic policy of evil. Acts 18. Verse 6. You're responsible for your own condemnation. I am clean. It's not God's fault. It's not Paul's fault. It's their fault. From henceforth I will go into the Gentiles. That's the second pronouncement in Acts. Acts 13, number 1. Acts 18, number 2. Acts 28, number 3. Here is Israel's diminishing. Paul's provoking ministry overlaps with Israel's diminishing. Romans 11, 14. Romans 11, verses 11 through 14. Israel will be shaken off in judgment like we would shake off dust from our clothes. Paul signal to Israel by shaking his clothes you are to blame for your own doom I gave you the word of God but you didn't care not an evidence problem not an evidence problem not an evidence problem. If only they would have heard from God, surely they would have believed. They did hear. Did they believe? No. Our world today has had a completed Bible for 20 centuries. 20 centuries. If only God would speak, 
We believe. Just show me a sign, God, I'll believe you exist. Perhaps this Bible is a sign, but people turn a blind eye and a deaf ear to it. Where's the proof? Heart, 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 heart problem. That's the problem. Not a lack of evidence, lack of proof, but a lack of faith and a willingness to see the evidence, to believe the evidence, the proof. Not God's fault. God has left Israel and is going to the Gentiles, has been going to the Gentiles since Acts 9. In Acts 13, Paul announced it in Asia, Turkey. Acts 13, Antioch of Pisidia. Number one, we turn to the Gentiles. See the distance from Palestine, the land of Canaan, Israel. Number two, Acts 18. Paul says it again. I go to the Gentiles. Where is that? Ah, right here. See, a farther distance from here. Acts 13, to here, Acts 18, read Acts 28, that's way out in Rome. So here was Asia, here's Europe, Corinth, Acts 28, look how far away, there's number three, look how far from Palestine, Acts 13, Acts 18, Acts 28, the world capital, Rome. Paul is way out in Rome. The salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles. Mm -hmm. And the book of Acts closes. Acts 18, verse 7. Where does Paul go after leaving the Jewish synagogue? right next door to the Gentiles. <laughs> I go to the Gentiles! Just steps away. On the other side of the wall is Justice's house. Acts 18, 7. Paul departed thence and entered into a certain man's house, Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. There's a common wall between the synagogue and Justice's house. There's no alleyway. There's no space. There's a wall. On one side of the wall is the Corinthian synagogue. On the other side is Justice's house. This Gentile living next door to the synagogue. His house is joined whore. There's a common wall between them to the synagogue. Verse 8, Acts 18, 8. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Paul, going to those synagogues, Endeavoring to evangelize, preach the gospel of grace to lost Israel so they can become members of the church, the body of Christ. Paul is rendering Israel scattered outside of Palestine without excuse. Jesus was rejected in the land. Israel killed him 20 years ago. 
don't you reject him out of the land. Paul's ministry. Three, Paul is announcing to Israel in those synagogues the change in program from law to grace, prophecy to mystery, Peter to Paul. Israel to the body of Christ. Paul is confirming how Jesus is Christ, Messiah. He is condemning Israel for unbelief, and he is preaching the revelation of the mystery. Christ Jesus according to mystery. The mystery program. Pauline doctrine. Pauline doctrine. 1 Corinthians. After Paul left Corinth, he wrote two epistles to them. Our Bible books here of first and second Corinthians. Corinthians. First Corinthians fifteen. Verse one. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I have preached unto you. Unless ye have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. I preached the gospel to you, Corinthians. When, when was that? Uh, Acts 18. There's the gospel of grace. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. The professing church still hasn't gotten that right in 2,000 years. The gospel of grace, Acts 20:24, 20, Paul's gospel, is 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. How many sermons are preached? How many gospel tracts are passed out? How many books are written about the gospel? The gospel, the gospel but they never quote 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. They'll quote John 3, 16, Romans 10, 9 and 10, Acts 2, 38, Romans 3, 23, Romans 6, 23, and a whole bunch of other passages, most of them having zilch to do with us and God's purpose and plan for today. But they never quote 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. And then you have people who base their Bible understanding on those tracts and sermons and books. And they go around wondering, I don't know enough to share the gospel with anyone. Of course not. You didn't have a pure gospel in the first place. And I'll tell you this. For a long time, my denominational system cheated me out of the truth. Hmm? I speak from experience. Mark it in your Bible. Memorize it. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. Christ died. That's not enough. Christ died for our sins. Okay. He didn't simply die. He died for a purpose. What was the purpose? For our sins. Okay. Christ died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again the third day. Resurrection. Death, burial, and resurrection. Where is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ in John 3.16? Not there, huh? What about Acts 2.38? Not there, huh? Could it be perhaps people are reading Paul's gospel into those verses when it isn't there at all? 
precisely. Eisegesis. Inserting concepts into verses when those concepts aren't there. The book of Acts, while it gives an awful lot of information, Luke's purpose is not to provide every little detail about what Paul is preaching. For example, we don't know what Paul preached in Acts 18 in Corinth until we go to 1 Corinthians 15. See, what did they believe? They believed on the Lord, Acts 18. Believed what? Jesus Christ's finished cross work. See, if we want to learn what Paul taught, we go to his epistles, Romans to Philemon. Romans to Philemon. Acts 18, 8. Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, like the pastor, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptized. Water baptism and Paul's ministry again. This is Paul's provoking ministry. This is his Acts ministry. Israel is diminishing. She is becoming less and less of an issue, but God is still talking to her, signaling to her through Paul. What Peter did, Paul does. Peter was water baptized, Paul was water baptized. Peter water baptized converts, Paul water baptized converts. Peter spoke with tongues, Paul spoke with tongues. Peter performed miracles, Paul performed miracles. Peter had a vision, Paul had a vision. On and on and on. Peter went to prison, Paul went to prison. Peter laid hands to impart the Holy Ghost. Paul laid hands to impart the Holy Ghost. That would be Acts 19. All those parallels indicate Peter has given way to Paul. Prophecy is giving way to mystery. It isn't that complicated. Water baptism, while it belongs in the Old Testament economy, the Levitical priests and Christ's earth and ministry, and early Acts, and the transitional period of Acts, it does not belong in our dispensation. So we can be scriptural, biblical, assume what is outside of our dispensation belongs to us and be out of God's will. It has happened throughout church history. And that is why the church, <laughs> professing church, is in doctrinal ruin, shambles. Not God's fault. Instead of listening to the Lord's heavenly ministry, there is that obsession with His earthly ministry and the law of Moses and the law system and the signs, miracles, and wonders. The Ten Commandments, the Sermon on the Mount. What does that communicate to us today? How does that relate to us today? It doesn't relate to us. There is a change in program. It's all God's Word. But what is God's Word to and about us? The average church member does not know. Because the preacher, the teacher, the priest, the pope, the professor has never told them. <laughs> they probably don't know it either. Because the nominationalism has robbed them too of Bible clarity. Not God's fault. Acts 18. Paul in Corinth. Water baptizing for Israel's sake. The provoking ministry of Paul in Acts. Water baptism in Paul 
are the exception, not the norm. Read Paul's epistles, Romans to Philemon. How many commandments in Paul's epistles are there about being water baptized for a salvation, for a testimony? None. None. You say, what about Acts 2.38? Or what about Jesus? I want to be water baptized like Jesus. Follow Jesus in believer's baptism. No, that, see, that would be unbeliever's baptism. We rightly divide the word of truth. Christ's earthly ministry is to Israel, was to Israel. You can read, my friend, can't you? Matthew 15, 24, Romans 15, 8. What is the Lord's ministry to us? Is it His earthly ministry? No, His heavenly ministry. Paul, the Lord's word through the Apostle Paul. Paul is not talking in Acts 2, 38. Peter is. Peter is speaking to Israel. Acts 2, 36. Not us. Make sure you get it straight. Oh, Lord, help us. The so-called church doesn't have a clue. Ignorant, 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 ignorant. We'll see more of that later in Acts 18. I guarantee it. Paul were to baptizing those Corinthians. Paul were to baptized in Acts 16. Lydia and her household. And the Philippian jailer and his household. And these Corinthians. That'd be 1 Corinthians 1. And Acts 19. Paul water baptized them. That's it. Nothing else about water baptism in Paul. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. One. One. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Ephesians 4, 5. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. The body of Christ. That's not water. When we believe in the heart, not just the head, intellectual agreement, mental assent. When we believe in the heart, Paul's gospel, Christ died for our sins, he was buried, he rose again the third day. We are identified with the church, the body of Christ, because the Holy Spirit Unites us with the body of Christ. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. That's not order. Not order. Not a order ceremony. No. Only when we wear denominational eyeglasses will we read there water in 1 Corinthians 12. It's not water. Acts 18, 9. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak. Hold not thy peace. Speak up, Paul. Don't be afraid. Don't be quiet. Paul is trembling. He's scared. 1 Corinthians 2. Satan's policy of evil. Paul will not change the message. Satan attacked the message. Paul will not alter the doctrine. So now Satan switches to attack the messenger. The Bible is incomplete. Paul needs encouragement. The Lord intervenes and speaks to Paul in a night vision. He's disheartened. He's discouraged. Paul, I'm with thee. Verse 10. No man shall sit on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And Paul continues, verse 11, for a year and six months in Corinth, teaching the word of God among them. New 
believers in Christ taught sound Bible doctrine. Okay. Paul spent a year and a half with them. The apostle himself. Read First Corinthians. Second Corinthians, not as pathetic, but read First Corinthians at least. Extremely disturbing. The carnality, the worldliness, the fleshliness, the immaturity of these Christians, 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 genuine members of the body of Christ, not simply church members, but believers in Christ. Oh, it's like they're lost people. Nothing but problems in Corinth. The Corinthian saints heard sound Bible doctrine for a year and a half. Grace teaching. Look how they turned out. That's the professing church now. Right now. Right now. How relevant. We have had 2,000 years of grace teaching Paul's ministry still operating right now. So let's not be too harsh concerning the Corinthians. The same problems they struggled with, most believers today still wrestle with. Grace assemblies to Not God's fault. Verse 12. Paul was not run out of town. The devil didn't win. All right. I'll try another tactic. In Philippi there, Satan used the devil girl the woman preacher, the damsel, to distract Paul, irritate Paul, corrupt Paul. Didn't work. Didn't work. The evil spirit was cast out of that girl. Satan just used someone else, unbelieving Gentiles, and the government of Philippi. Okay, well here... Paul was afraid. He was quiet in Corinth. He continues for a year and six months after the Lord encouraged him. The devil doesn't give up easily. Amen, 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 amen. Satan has another trick. Another scheme. Oh, I know. I'll use apostate Israel. <laughs> and I'll get rid of Paul that way. Acts 18, 12. And when Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, Rome's highest ranking politician in southern Greece. Here is Achaia, or Achaia, in Corinth. See, here's Corinth. Here's Achaia, or Achaia. Twelve. The Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul. Unbelievers united. Standing against Paul. The Lord's ministry through Paul. And brought him to the judgment seat. Saying, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the law. Get Paul in trouble with the government. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said unto the Jews, If it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. 
But if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Get out of here with that silliness. You waste my time, this court's time. Out. Get out. Hmm. If it's something about your law, you settle it among yourselves. I won't bother. You're dismissed. Leave. Acts 18, 17. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. This is Crispus's successor. Crispus is a believer. Read 1 Corinthians 1 verse 1. Sosthenes becomes a Christian also. That's two chief rulers of the synagogue in Corinth. One Christ. Hmm. They beat Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogue, before the judgment seat. Gallio's throne, judgment throne, his stone throne before his house there in Corinth, his palace. They beat Sosthenes. And Gallio cared for none of those things. It doesn't bother me. I don't get involved either. Acts 18, 18. And Paul, after this, tarried there yet a good while. So this is beyond the year and a half. Still in Corinth, a good while. How long? We don't know. We aren't told. Some months? Several months? A year? Who knows? Doesn't matter. The Holy Spirit withheld that information. Paul was not driven out of town again. After the court proceedings with Gallio, Paul continues in Corinth a good while. Then he took his leave of the brethren, Acts 18, 18, and sailed thence into Syria, taking with him Priscilla and Aquila having shorn his head in Sincrea, for he had a vow. Paul and the Nazarite vow. We are under grace, Romans 6, 14, 15, not law. Well then, what is Paul, our apostle, doing following the law of Moses? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, that would be... We've already answered the question before it was asked. This is Paul's Acts ministry, correct? Paul is conducting his Acts ministry with Israel in mind. Who is under the law or who thinks they're under the law? Uh, maybe Israel, lost Israel. And Paul is trying to tell them, listen to me. You're under grace. But before he can show them they're under grace, he's under grace, we're under grace, he needs to demonstrate to them he doesn't hate Moses. He's not anti-Moses. He's not antagonistic toward Moses and the law. So, to prove to lost Israel he is their friend, Paul conducts his life and ministry with Israel in mind. Just like with Timothy's physical circumcision in Acts 16. Acts 18, verse 18. Synchria. I still didn't look at the map, huh? <laughs> Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla leave Achaia, or Achaia, by ship. Corinth is in the northwest. 
Sincrea is the southern part of Corinth. Sincrea. On the southern end of the isthmus. <laughs> Here is Corinth. Here is Sincrea to the south not far from each other. Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla will sail to Ephesus here, Asia Minor. The capital of Asia Minor, Ephesus, Western Turkey. Paul has taken a vow and he has shaved his head in Sincrea. He is bringing that hair as indicated in number six to Jerusalem to offer in the Jerusalem temple. He let his hair grow long and then he cut it. And now he's taking that hair to Jerusalem, to the temple. Acts 18, verse 19, And he came to Ephesus and left them there, left Priscilla and Aquila there. But he himself entered into the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Synagogue again. When they desired him to tarry longer time with them, he consented not. Stay, stay with us. No, I must leave. Look, a warm welcome from some synagogue Jews. Huh, that's never happened before with Paul. That shorn head, that hair that he has is probably influential. Yes, he is our friend. He doesn't hate Moses. He took the Nazarite vow. And they want him to stay more with them. No, I have to go. I cannot stay. Acts 18, 21. He bade them farewell, saying, I must by all means keep this feast that cometh in Jerusalem. Whatever feast it is, I don't know. But there's a feast in Jerusalem. Paul is destined for Jerusalem. And that's why he's in a hurry. But if God will, I will return again to you. He did not spend a long time in Ephesus. He will write to these believers years later at the end of Acts. Ephesians. He will be back in Ephesus in chapter 19. That will be our next study. Acts 18, 21, and he sailed from Ephesus. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up and saluted the church, he went down to Antioch. So that is the end of Paul's second apostolic. Apostolic, not missionary, apostolic journey. Acts 15, verse 39. Paul's second apostolic journey. That's the beginning. He left Antioch, Syria with Silas. They moved over into Syria, Cilicia, and this is Acts 15 into 16. Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, Pisidia, Phrygia, this area, central Turkey. Acts 16, containing Messiah, Troas, Semotres, going to Macedonia, Neapolis, Philippi, and Phippolis, Apollonia, Thessalonica, Berea. This is now Acts 17. Paul in the ship. Athens, Corinth, Sincrea. They sail to 
Ephesus, and then they continue down to Caesarea, the port of Jerusalem. He goes to Jerusalem for the feast, and then back to Antioch, Syria. Oof. The second apostolic journey of Paul. Something like 3,000 miles, 4,800 kilometers. Roughly half of that was by ship, so it was quick, quicker. Up to four years long, our apostolic journey diagram. Apostolic journey number two is over. Paul spends time in Antioch, Syria. And now, after almost an hour of review, <laughs> our current study, verse 23. Acts 18, verse 23. He's in Antioch, Syria. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order strengthening all the disciples. So Paul's third apostolic journey, Acts 18.23, begins there. And we will assign the starting date of A.D. 50. Three. Paul's third apostolic, apostolic journey will cover the rest of Acts 18, all of Acts 19, all of Acts 20, into chapter 21, verse 17. Back to the map. Paul, on his third apostolic journey, will cover this area. Here's the route for the third apostolic journey. From Antioch, Syria, he moves this way. ending in Jerusalem. The third apostolic journey of Paul will span approximately five years. Acts 18.23 And after he had spent some time there, Antioch, Syria, he departed and went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Galatia, Phrygia. Galatia, Phrygia. Paul was in this 
territory back in chapters 13, 14, his first apostolic journey, and chapter 16, his second apostolic journey. Look, Phrygia and Galatia, central Turkey. So Paul is back visiting Derby, Lystra, Iconium, Antioch of Pisidia, Phrygia, Galatia. Galatia, by the way, is not a town or a city. It's a region. region. The book of Galatians is to the churches of Galatia. There's more than one. Paul is revisiting these believers, these Christians. He won to Christ years earlier. These are not lost people. They're saved. They are Paul's converts. Acts 18.23 He went over all the country of Galatia and Phrygia in order. There's a schedule. There's a system here. He systematically targets these places. He strengthens all the disciples Acts 14, 22. Confirming the souls of the disciples. This is his first apostolic journey. Lystra, Iconium, Antioch. That's the same area in chapter 18. Confirming the souls of the disciples. That's the same Greek word translated strengthening in Acts 18, verse 23. Confirming, firm. Confirm with firm, with strength, confirming the souls of the disciples, teaching them sound Bible doctrine so they can grow up, grow up in the faith. Be mature members of the body of Christ who can do the work of the ministry. Ephesians 4, Acts 15, 32. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren, Paul's converts, with many words, and confirmed them. Verse 41, Acts 15, And he, Paul, went through Syria and Cilicia, confirming the churches. Paul didn't leave these local assemblies to fend for themselves. Okay, I won you to Christ. Good luck. Surviving the apostasy and idolatry all around you. He gave them more sound Bible doctrine by which they could grow spiritually. Grow up! Grow up! Grow up! It's not enough to be saved. We don't worry about anything else but preaching the gospel. Yeah, well, I hope you know what that gospel is, my friend. How frequently it's stated. We don't get into doctrine. We don't focus on Bible versions. We just preach the gospel. We don't get to those finer points of doctrine. We just stay with the gospel. The gospel is what's important. Uh, Paul believed there was something else beyond just the gospel and getting saved. How about we read 1 Timothy 2? I believe Paul would know a little more about ministry than preachers today. Scholars. First Timothy 2. Here is the Holy Spirit writing to the church, the body of Christ. First Timothy 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Is there a period there? No. Well, keep reading. And 
and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. God our Savior, Jesus Christ our Savior, he died for all to be testified in due time. There's all men to be saved and God's will is twofold. Have all people saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. Now what would that be? That's something after salvation, justification, believing the gospel of grace. Look, verse 7, whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ, and lie not a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Paul is the due time testifier of Christ giving his life a ransom for all. After we come to faith in Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, his finished cross work is sufficient payment for our sins. We should learn, we should grow up, we should develop, we should mature to understand why Christ died and why He saved us. Why did He die to save us? What will He do with us now that we are saved? See, the gospel, having the gospel, knowing the gospel is not enough. You have to learn more. Okay, listen, think about it. Think, think. There are 13 epistles of Paul, correct? And Paul discusses more than just the gospel message, doesn't he, in those 13 epistles? Of course he does. What about daily Christian living? Okay, That's built on the gospel, but it's not simply Christ died for our sins, he was buried and rose again the third day. I know that, that's all I need to know. There's more than just that in grace teaching. God, our Savior, wants all men to be saved. Men here is generic. Okay? All people to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. How many members of the church, the body of Christ, have never come to the knowledge of the truth? They're saved, but no coming to the knowledge of the truth. They're trapped in their denominational systems. Mm, 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 mm. They better come to Romans through Philemon and quickly and get to studying and stop mindlessly repeating what they've heard in a classroom or a church building. It's been a few years since Paul has seen these Galatians and Phrygians. Acts 18.23 But he strengthens them, the disciples, these students, these followers of Jesus Christ. They follow Paul as he follows Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 11. One. And that's all that we read about Paul in this chapter. A new character enters the scene at this point. Apollos. Who is he? Why is he here? Acts 18, 24. Verse 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in the Spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them, and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. 
And when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, or Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him, who, when he was come, helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Paul was in Ephesus, verse 19 and 20 and 21. Paul had a ministry in Ephesus. Paul goes away. Apollos has a ministry in Ephesus now. Apollos. His name is derived from the Greek sun god, Apollo. Apollos comes into town in Ephesus. Apollos, Acts 18, 24. He's a certain Jew named Apollos, of course. I just said that. Born at Alexandria. Alexandria. Alexandria, present, Scandaria. It's a real place. Is Egypt. Egypt. Down here, Alexandria, Egypt. On the Nile Delta where the Nile empties into the Mediterranean Sea, there is a city, Alexandria, Alexandria, Egypt. It's second to Athens in terms of wisdom and learning, education worship. Wisdom worship, the wisdom of men, wisdom of men. Alexandria, listen, listen to the name. Alexandria. It dates back to the time of Alexander the Great, 300 years before Christ. Alexandria was named after the Greek king, Alexander the Great. During the centuries before Christ, Alexandria boasted a library that had as many as 700,000 books, scrolls. A lot of quote wisdom there, huh? Like in Athens. But how much sound Bible doctrine? Divine wisdom. Divine knowledge. Divine understanding. God's wisdom. God's knowledge. God's understanding. Brilliant minds. But spiritual fools. Mm -hmm. Like Athens. After. The time of the apostles. Alexandria was home to an apostate seminary, a Bible cemetery, where Bible truth died and was buried under layers of church tradition and Greek and Egyptian religion. Superstition, heresy, apostasy, and Gnosticism. It was here in Alexandria, the ancient capital of Egypt, that allegorizing the scriptures was popularized. The verses don't mean what they say. They have a hidden meaning that only the scholars can figure out. That's actually a well-known approach to Bible study even now, quote, Bible study. <laughs> We don't take the Bible literally. It's figurative. And then see, we can invent all kinds of church traditions. Even though they contradict the Bible. Oh, we don't take the Bible literally. But we take the church traditions literally. <laughs> and of course, the Bible verses that support the church tradition, those are literal. <laughs> How convenient. Alexandria was filled 
and others with error. Some of Christendom's best known church fathers, theologians, hailed from Alexandria, Origen, and others. Philo, or Philo, he was the first major false teacher from Alexandria. Origen, by the way, has been acclaimed as one of the best Bible scholars of church history. <laughs> and Origen popularized an allegorical approach to the scriptures, non-literal. The blind leading the blind. Even now, 2,000 years later, The Bible, by the way, if we're a, a Bible believer, if we're Bible believers, we believe the Bible. If we aren't Bible believers, we should publicly admit it. I don't believe the Bible. There, see? Say it, and no one will get confused. Instead, there are far too many saying, I believe the Bible. <laughs> they really don't. They don't even know what the Bible teaches, but they believe it. <laughs> Ridiculous. Unless you know something, you can't believe it. The Bible takes a negative view, a negative view of Egypt and Alexandria. Several times, the Old Testament scriptures title Egypt as the house of bondage. Where was Israel for centuries? In the book of Genesis and early Exodus. Uh, slaves in Egypt? Why would Egypt be called the house of bondage? Uh, maybe because there's physical slavery and spiritual slavery there. Yeah. Egypt is a type of the world. God called Israel from Egypt. You do not return to Egypt. In fact, Deuteronomy 17, Israel's monarch was not even supposed to buy horses from Egypt. I do not want my people, Israel, going to Egypt for anything. They've already spent time in Egypt. That time is finished. It's over. The Lord called them out of Egypt. Now, I've told you about this so often. Textual criticism is at the heart of the Bible versions movement. The Bible versions issue, Bible versions debate. You see, during these last 250 years, but especially the prior 150 years from this present time, Christendom has been increasingly encouraged to seek a Bible from Egypt, from Alexandria, from Origen, the church father and Bible corrupter Origen. The Alexandrian manuscripts, the Alexandrian manuscripts are the scholar's preferred Bible. The two chief representatives or manuscripts or 
codices, books, of the Alexandrian text, or Vaticanus and Sinaiticus. If you read footnotes of modern English versions, you listen to the professors, the preachers, who grew up, who were trained in seminary, Bible college, <laughs> they favor the Alexandrian readings. And they claim the oldest and best manuscripts say this or that or whatever. What they're doing is appealing to Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, predominantly. They are taking our King James Bible and correcting it using the Roman Catholic Bible. Mm -hmm. Listen again, listen. Vaticanus. Who owns Vaticanus? Perhaps the Vatican? Of course, of course. Vaticanus is the Pope's Bible. Do you know, for the last 150 years, Protestants have been using the Pope's Bible? Hmm? Our professors and pastors and teachers keep that hush-hush. Perhaps they don't know. Perhaps they do. They're not all completely innocent in ignorance. Mm -mm. I've met a few who know they are wrong, but they'll never admit it. No, my scholarship couldn't be wrong. I didn't spend $20,000 in seminary to be lied to. Mm -mm. I was told the truth. The point is, listen, the Antiochian manuscripts that underline our King James Bible are criticized and disparaged, ridiculed. And that has been especially true these last 150 years. The Protestant text of the Reformation is represented today in our King James Bible. But what the Roman Catholic Church has done is infiltrate our institutions of higher learning and influence our ministers, our preachers, our teachers to discord the Protestant Bible, the King James Bible. And look, here's Rome holding out a Bible. You can have ours. Ah, <laughs> uh, ah. Uh. Who knows that, though? Mm -hmm. Precious few, precious few. And those who do say something about it are labeled cultic, heretics, Troublemakers, church splitters. No, 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 look. The people promoting the error, they are the church splitters. Romans 16. They cause the visions contrary to the doctrine which we have learned. They're the heretics. Okay. Our King James Bible has been used for over 400 years. It's English is superior to modern English. Older English is dead English. The definitions do not change. Modern English changes. Modern English is a living language. Can we afford to be changing our standard of right and wrong? <laughs> We've been doing that for over a hundred years thanks to Roman scholarship. Since 1881, the English-speaking Christian world has been offered a multiplicity of conflicting books, 
200 modern English versions. Can the English language be changing that much to necessitate a new version every six months? <laughs> I think filthy lucre, greed, the love of money plays a large role in a new version every six months. We have something to sell you. Here you go. Until we have a new manuscript discovery or another whim of philosophy and we'll change that, we'll revise it and give you another version to sell. <laughs> another version to buy. Millions of gullible Christians will hastily purchase that latest modern English version. That cycle has repeated over and over for decades. Thanks, scholarship. Thank you. I trust the scholars. <laughs> well, let's see where that's gotten us these last 150 years. More apostasy, more error, more confusion, more doubt. Let's keep on trusting the scholars. Instead of being grateful for our King James Bible, See, this is how Satan works. This is the big game. Mm-hmm. It's a spiritual battle. Oh, what Bible ignorance. We keep our King James Bible. We don't listen to the, quote, oldest and best witnesses. Oldest and best, Vaticanus and Sinaiticus, have 3,000 differences alone in just the four gospel records. <laughs> Oldest and best? I don't think so. And just because there's an old manuscript? Hey, 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, false teachers were writing fake Bibles 2,000 years ago. False teachers go back quite a long time. An old manuscript does not necessarily mean a good manuscript. I was reading a professor. <laughs> His little childish article complaining about the King James Bible. I don't believe the King James Bible is the best English translation. Oh, well, he translated a modern English version. He probably wants to sell his instead. <laughs> anyway, he argued, what Bible verse tells me I should believe the King James Bible is God's word, final word, in English. I don't know of any such verse. Oh, good doctor, you don't. Perhaps take your Greek New Testament and read Acts 11 and Acts 18. Perhaps you will find a verse there. A Greek scholar, but not a Bible scholar. They know Greek, they know Hebrew, they know Latin, they know church history, they know the church fathers, but they don't know the Bible. Yet, they are lauded, praised, acclaimed as Bible scholars. <laughs> they are theology scholars, church scholars, religion scholars, but not Bible scholars. Natural man thinking scholars. Let's try two verses. Acts 11, Acts 11, 26. And when he had found him, Barnabas found Saul, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Alexandria, no. Jerusalem, no. Rome, no. Antioch! Antioch. Antioch, Syria. Put a star by Acts 11, 26. 
Greek scholars seem to overlook this verse. How convenient. <laughs> the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. So, if I were looking for a Bible, a trustworthy Bible, hmm, I don't know, maybe the Christians in Antioch had a Bible. I think so. What about we look at Antioch, Syria, for the Bible? The scholar declares, no, no, mm -mm. they prefer Alexandria, Alexandria, hmm. okay, well, let's see, so far, the Bible indicates to us, Antioch is the better place as opposed to Alexandria. We don't go to Egypt, that's the world, that's the house of bondage, that's where Satan infected Israel with pagan religion for centuries and kept them in political bondage. Pharaoh. Hey, Acts 11.26 Antioch, Syria Antioch, Syria. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. The King James Bible is derived, based on, derived from, the Antiochian manuscripts. Modern English versions are translated from the Alexandrian family of manuscripts. So you have Christians now telling you they don't know what Bible they should use. You know what that is? Bible ignorance, even among scholars, so-called scholars. Ha! Huh? They're promoting Alexandrian Egyptian Bibles they have for over a hundred years. And how frightening it is to think they lead our churches. They teach in our schools. The blind leading the blind. Oh, really? 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 They need to do some Bible study before they talk at all about the Bible or Christianity or the Gospel. Ooh. This is Satan's Best kept secret, the spiritual battle. Acts 18, listen. Acts 18, 24. And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. Look at those qualifications. He is... Eloquent. Someone who can employ fluent, powerful, forceful, appropriate speech. Oh, is he a good speaker? He sounds so good. He's intelligent. He's polished. He's charismatic. Oh, we could sit and listen to him for hours. Whatever he tells us. We don't question anything. We take it all in like a sponge. Just suck it up. That's countless ministers, teachers, professors, preachers, priests. Today. People. Listen to them. Pay attention to them. Praise them. They don't question them. He's been to college. He's been to Bible school. He knows the truth. <laughs> yeah, 
probably does. But is he telling you the truth? I have my doubts. I've met people who knew the truth but didn't say anything because it would cause controversy in their church and they would be removed from the pulpit. Apollos is an eloquent man. Acts 18 verse 24 He's mighty in the scriptures. He's powerful. He knows Bible verses. That reminds me. Wait. Hold that thought. Mighty in the scriptures. He came to Ephesus 24. Ephesus. That's where Paul was visiting earlier. Apollos was mighty in the scriptures, the Old Testament scriptures, the Hebrew Bible. Mighty in the scriptures, knowledgeable in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. But does that make him a sound Bible authority? A dependable, reliable Bible teacher. Verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. Oh, that sounds wonderful too, huh? And being fervent in the Spirit. He's zealous. He's passionate. He spake and taught diligently. The things of the Lord. All knowing only the baptism of John. Mm. 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 It all sounded so good up to that point. Well, maybe Apollos isn't. Worthy of our attention, after all. Acts 18, 24. Apollos, born at Alexandria. He's a wise man. Alexandria, second only to Athens in terms of Education and scholarship and learning and wisdom of men. Alexandria. So, we can think of Apollos as a seminary graduate. He has a doctorate in theology. Or a doctrine, philosophy, or perhaps two doctrines. A lot of degrees. Papers hanging on the wall. I know this, I know that, I know this, I know that. He's an eloquent man. He's a professional speech. Utterer, professional speaker. Excellent grammar. Skilled, proficient. He's mighty in the scriptures. Comes to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord. He's taught. And being fervent in the spirit. Zealous. Zealous, passionate, enthusiastic. Ooh, do I want to speak to people and tell them what I've learned, tell them what I know. There's nothing wrong with that.
Romans 12. Okay, listen. Romans 12, verse 11. Fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Every believer should be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Someone who is willing to get things done. He's not a loafer, slothful, sitting around. I don't have any motivation to do anything. No. He conducts a ministry as best as he can. A limited ministry. Limited knowledge. Romans 10. Listen. Romans 10. 1. Paul writing. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant. What is it? What is it? What is it? There it is again. It never goes away, does it? Never. It always pops up at some point. Romans 10, 3, for they being ignorant, unknowing, unlearned of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Israel in Acts is in unbelief. They are zealous in religion. That was Saul of Tarsus in early Acts. Philippians 3. Zealous. And yet lost. Zealous in Judaism. Lost. That was the Apostle Paul. Before his salvation. Like so many now in religion. Zealous but lost. They're passionate about their religion. Their Jewish heritage. Oh, do we want to do this and we want to do that for the Lord? We want to be God's people. That doesn't sound evil, but it is. Why? Because they are trying to make themselves God's people. We don't need God's righteousness. We are good enough. Self-deception. No, you aren't. You need the Savior just like me. Paul is preaching to them. He was a works religion man just like they were. Look at Acts 7, Acts 8, and to Acts 9. Religious but lost. On his way to a devil's hell. I'm good enough. I'm good enough. I am pious, religious, devout. And if I'm not going into heaven, no one is. Oh yes, we know all about that. We hear that all the time. I know I do. Good enough. No. You have it submitted to the righteousness of God. The cross of Christ says none of us are good enough. That's why Jesus died. He's good enough to take our place. Because we are not good enough. The offense of the cross. You mean I can't brag about how good I am? No, you cannot. Oh. Oh. Wounded ego. Swallow the pride, my friend. Recognize your sin problem. And come to trust. Jesus Christ's solution. He died for those sins. He was buried. He was raised again.
or our justification, to give us a right standing before God Almighty that we would never have apart from Him the righteousness of God in Christ, not in ourselves. See, Israel didn't want to believe that in Matthew to John. We're good enough. We don't need God's righteousness. They didn't want to believe that in Acts either, whether Peter or Paul's ministry. And Paul, his heart's desire, oh, if only Israel would be saved from the error they're in, like I was saved from that error. Works, religion, self-righteousness, To tell them they needed the Savior. Did they want to hear him? Huh? Hmm. Rarely. Yes, there were believers, but few. Few believing Israelites in those synagogues. Acts 18, 24. Apollos, born in Alexandria, eloquent, mighty in the scriptures, instructed in the way of the Lord, fervent in the spirit, speaking and teaching diligently the things of the Lord. He's a Bible teacher. He's an educator, instructor, and he carefully outlines the things of the Lord. He's sincere. I don't doubt that for half a second. But he is sincerely wrong. I do not believe Apollos is intentionally misleading. But he is misleading nonetheless. Acts 18, 25, look, knowing only the baptism of John. Ooh. Many years ago, when I was a boy, my parents and I would watch a certain prophecy preacher. He promoted Bible memorization. Allegedly, he had memorized 15,000 Bible verses. When we'd watch him, oh, he'd quote those passages like that. Wow. You'd get Whiplash, trying to follow him. A famous Bible teacher, now with the Lord, I presume. A friend of mine in ministry had written to him about some of his theological errors. He was misled, and he did not admit he was wrong. Okay. My friend attempted to reform that Bible teacher to no avail. The man who knew 15,000 verses had aligned himself with a cult because a large percentage of his audience and supporters were of that persuasion. He could not afford to expose that cult and admit they were wrong. There goes my funding, or a majority of it. Let me tell you, my friend, just because someone quotes 
Bible verses. I don't care if they quote 15,000 verses to you. That does not automatically make that person sound and their theology worth embracing. Apollos sounded good. He had the right intention. I don't, I don't doubt that at all. Apollos was trained, a formally trained minister. But he was not a sound Bible authority. A man skillful in Bible verses is not necessarily serving and glorifying the God of Bible. Oh, they quote the Bible, they read the Bible in my church. God's there. <laughs> and I don't believe. Not necessarily. Hmm. Dear friend, there's one being who puts all of us to shame, quoting scriptures. Matthew 4, Luke 4, the devil. Satan knows the Bible better than all of us combined. He studied it for 6,000 years, a little longer than we have. I think the devil knows a few more than 15,000 verses. He quoted Psalm 91 to the Lord Jesus, Matthew 4, Luke 4. Was Satan serving God? No, but he was quoting the Bible, huh? You can be scriptural, you can be biblical, and be out of God's will, too. Satan does not mind quoting a verse here or there. That's how you deceive someone in the thinking you represent God. Quote a Bible verse. Oh, yes. There's God's man. He gave me a Bible verse. <clears throat> I sure hope it wasn't the being who confronted Jesus in Matthew 4 and Luke 4. He quoted Bible verses too. See, we need to grow up. Grow up! Years back, I dealt with a woman. She's in heaven now. Straighten out, praise the Lord. But she was of the persuasion, they believe in Jesus. This certain cult, they believe in Jesus. She said, they're not Christian. I told her, no, they aren't. Huh? But they believe in Jesus. The devils believe and tremble, James too. Are they Christians? Shallow, 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 childish thinking here. Grow up, grow up. Not everyone who quotes the Bible knows the God of the Bible personally. Not everyone who sings about heaven is going there. Be extremely careful. Extremely careful. First Corinthians 2, listen, verse 9, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the Spirit of of man which is in him, even so the things of God knoweth no man, but the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, 
that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, philosophy, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man, the man without the influence of the Holy Spirit, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things. Yet he himself is judged of no man, for who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. The natural man, the person who is unsaved. There's no indwelling Holy Spirit to teach that person. That does not mean the person cannot memorize church history facts and church father quotations and learn biblical Greek and Hebrew and Aramaic and Latin But it does mean that person cannot correctly interpret the Bible. It is not a Bible authority. There are innumerable people in ministry today who are lost. They have not trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And they are teaching people in the name of Jesus Christ. They're holding church services. Let me give you an example. Several years ago, I spoke with a religious leader. I knew his denomination. I knew it well. We had conversed about this before. His church doesn't like the Bible. Of course not, because the Bible's the authority and the church wants to be the authority. <laughs> I was reasoning with this man out of the scriptures, trying to lead him down the right path. His church had deceived him, and he knew it. He knew it. He knew it. He had been to seminary for several years. He had been in ministry for quite a long time. It dawned on him as we were conversing. His church taught him one thing, and the verses I was sharing with him taught him something else. And when he was confronted with that conflict, he reacted, he responded to me with the following words, and listen well. I do not follow the Bible. I follow tradition. Okay? Now that was in private. Publicly, he wouldn't admit that because his group asserts itself to be a Bible-believing church when in fact it's a tradition-believing church. But if there is a verse from the Bible to support what they believe, then yes, they're quote Bible-believers. Otherwise, the Bible means nothing to them. It can't promote what they're doing. It isn't useful to them. The point is, and listen well, my friend, the point is, if there is one person with that kind of attitude toward the Bible in ministry, surely there's another, maybe thousands, leading churches under the guise of scholarship and Christianity. Oh, are we in deep trouble? Deep trouble.
trouble. Not God's fault. Anyway, the point is, 1 Corinthians 2. If they don't have the indwelling Holy Spirit, they will not teach sound Bible doctrine. Okay? If they're not letting the Holy Spirit teach them, all they have is the wisdom of men. And that is insufficient. Without the teaching ministry of the Holy Spirit, Bible study, Bible teaching is a waste of time. Okay? It's actually more destructive to have a Bible without the Holy Spirit than it is to have no Bible. Because having the Bible without the Holy Spirit, that seems somewhat good. Oh, we have a Bible, but where's the Holy Spirit's teaching ministry? Okay. Apollos is a victim of the evil world system. Bad education. He's educated, but he has the wrong education. Acts 18, verse 25, 24. Acts 18, 24. A certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria. That is a curse. Alexandria has corrupted him. An eloquent man, a mighty man in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit. He spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John, Wow, 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 wow. The scholarly elite here. Apollos. Quite commendable. His qualifications, his resume, commendable. We think quite highly of him and his ministry until we read. He knows only the baptism of John, verse 25. Acts 19, those opening verses, those may very well be Apollos' students, just as confused as he is. Apollos' Bible education is extremely limited. He knows only the baptism of John, John, John the Baptist. Think about that. John the Baptist. Matthew 3, Mark 1, Luke 3, John 1, John 3. John the Baptist had a ministry 20 plus years ago. Knowing only the baptism of John, Apollos, where have you been these last 20 years? What has happened since John's baptism? John the Baptist's ministry. Uh, what about Jesus' earthly ministry? What about Jesus dying? His death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, the coming of the Holy Spirit in Acts 2, the fall of Israel, Acts 7, the salvation and commissioning of the Apostle Paul, Acts 9. Apollos, do you know anything about any of that? No. Apollos is preaching out-of-date information. It is scripture. It is biblical. He's just far behind in his understanding. That's like Christendom today. They're still stuck in Matthew to John. Do they know the Lord's heavenly ministry through Paul? No. Well, Apollos is in a similar predicament. Apollos is way behind. Way behind. Ignorant. 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 But he is educated. Hmm... Acts 18, 26. 
and he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. Hallelujah. He's stirred up. He's fired up. He's eloquent. He's mighty in the scriptures. He's instructed in the way of the Lord. He's fervent in the spirit. He speaks and teaches diligently the things of the Lord. And off he goes preaching. Amen, brother. Wait. But before we agree with you, what are you preaching? What is the quality of that doctrine? Hmm. Acts 18, 26. Whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Aquila and Priscilla... There they are again. Paul left them in Ephesus. Verse 19. Aquila and Priscilla. Converts of Paul. Students of Paul. Aquila and Priscilla. Acts 18. 2. A certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. Paul came to them, verse 3, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. Paul lived with them. Paul taught them. Paul won them to Christ. Paul educated them in the word of God, rightly divided. He brought Aquila and Priscilla up to date. Aquila and Priscilla. Over here. Apollos, teaching. Whoa. That's wrong. That's all wrong. Aquila and Priscilla, however, do not embarrass Apollos. They take him to them. They take him off to the side there, and they teach him. In private. And notice here, Acts 18, 26, Aquila is first. Aquila and Priscilla. See verse 18, Priscilla and Aquila? But in the context of teaching, this husband and wife team, the husband is first. See, he's the leader, the spiritual leader, the head of the wife. Ephesians 5. The male leadership of the church. The local church, the ministry. 1 Timothy 2. God formed Adam first, then the woman. Now, if we don't follow that order, we'll wind up in Genesis 3, where the woman is the spiritual leader, the woman is the Bible teacher, and you saw what happened, huh? Okay, well, if we don't want to repeat in the local church, we better listen to 1 Timothy 2. Okay. Aquila and Priscilla, they are a husband-wife ministry team, but Aquila leads. Okay, be, be sure you grasp that, make a note of it, and don't forget it. Aquila and Priscilla, having learned from Paul, are now able to teach others the same information. Apollos, oh, do you need some theological reformation? Apollos is in spiritual darkness. Thank you, Alexandria. Hmm. Aquila and Priscilla, Bring Apollos out of spiritual darkness and ignorance and into the grace of God and his word rightly divided. Just like Paul did with Aquila and Priscilla, Aquila and Priscilla do with Apollos. You need to be brought up to date. Pauline doctrine, Romans to Philemon. There are many people in Christendom today, even Holy Spirit indwelt believers who are just ignorant of sound Bible teaching and dispensational Bible study as Apollos was. We need to be patient with them. We should 
try to Acts 18 26 expound unto them the way of God more perfectly you're lacking Apollos your understanding is imperfect it's limited but we are here to point you in the right direction listen pay attention 2nd Timothy 2nd Timothy 2 2nd Timothy 2 2nd Timothy 2 2 and the things that thou, Timothy, hast heard of me, Paul, among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. Paul taught Timothy. Timothy is to teach other men the same information. Don't change the doctrine. And those men can then teach others. Okay? It's simple. Now, if someone along in that chain changes the message, it's not God's fault. Okay. Doctrine doesn't matter. Oh, oh, oh. Well, if doctrine doesn't matter, cut out 2 Timothy 2.2 2 and many other verses. 2 Timothy 2. See, <laughs> doctrine does matter. Those who say it doesn't matter... Why they claim that is because doctrine gets in the way of what they want to do. We aren't here to study doctrine anyway. We have a social club. A time of food, fun, fellowship, and foolishness. That's why we come to church. We don't, we don't care. We couldn't care less about scripture. <laughs> ah, see, now we get a confession, huh? <laughs> At least they're honest. If doctrine means something to us, then we'd better listen to 2 Timothy 2. 2 Timothy 2.24 And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, able to teach. Aptitude, patient, in meekness, not, not pride, meekness, humility. Instructing. Ah, ah, ah. Bible ignorance. Okay. How do we get rid of Bible ignorance? Instruction. We replace Bible ignorance with Bible instruction, teaching. Sound Bible doctrine. Rightly divided scripture. 2 Timothy 2.15. 2 Timothy 2.25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Aquila and Priscilla are following 2 Timothy 2, verse 2, verses 24, 25, 26. In the case of Apollos, Apollos, Apollos needs instruction. Fine. Aquila and Priscilla already have it from Paul, and they're able to do the same with Apollos. Aquila and Priscilla, tent makers, teach Apollos. Explain the way of God more perfectly to Apollos. And Apollos is humble to the point where he admits his error. He has been formally educated, but he's willing to receive instruction from lowly tent makers. And you know what? Apollos will be a tremendous asset to Paul's ministry in the coming years. You see, Apollos' ministry improved in verses 27 and 28 of Acts 18. Come over to Acts 
Acts 19, 1, Apollos was at Corinth. Huh? Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 1, 12. After Paul visited Corinth, Acts 18, Apollos came to Corinth. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 12. See? And I of Apollos. See there? We have some denominations forming, though. Hmm. Sadly. 1 Corinthians 3, 4. For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. See? Verse 22, 1 Corinthians 3, Apollos. Chapter 4, verse 6. Apollos. See? Chapter 16, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 16, 12 is touching our brother Apollos. I greatly desired him to come unto you with the brethren, but his will was not at all to come this time, but he will come when he shall have convenient time. And one more. Titus 3. Titus 3. Titus 3, verse 13. Bring Zenos the lawyer and Apollos on their journey, Titus. Bring them diligently on their journey, that nothing be wanting unto them. Oh, but listen, watch. Titus 3, verse 9. But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. Ah, there's denominationalism, huh? Christian dumb. A man that is an heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Okay. None of us have everything 100% right. We should always be inclined to purifying our doctrine. We will not find a perfect church. We will not find perfect doctrine. Apart from the Word of God rightly divided. But we can have purer doctrine than what we know. See? Don't misunderstand. It's not a sin to be ignorant. We're all ignorant to some degree. It's a sin to be willfully ignorant. I don't know and I don't want to know the truth. That's a sin. We should be meek and inclined to come to a greater awareness of dispensational truth, like Apollos. Now, if we're sitting under sound Bible teaching, but not walking according to it, there's a problem. Willful ignorance. Okay. Now look, 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14. What have I said already about the Corinthians and Paul teaching them for more than a year and a half, 18 months. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. In Corinth, there are several so-called prophets and, quote, spiritual people. We speak for God. The Holy Spirit leads us. You do. He does. Okay. Well, here's the standard. Let that person acknowledge that the things that I, Paul, write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. There's apostolic authority. If anyone is so-called spiritual or 
an alleged prophet in Corinth, their message had better align with Pauline revelation here, or they're not serving the God of the Bible. It's not the Holy Spirit, it's some other spirit. It's the world, the flesh, the devil, but it's not the Holy Spirit. Hmm. Now look at Christendom today. Do they want to hear from the Lord through Paul? No. They go to Matthew to John. <laughs> Are they spiritual? No. Not according to 1 Corinthians 14.37. And I believe that verse is right. 38. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Oh, look at that. Look. That's willful ignorance, huh? What is it? Willful Bible ignorance. Someone in Corinth who's doing whatever they want, saying whatever they want, when they receive this epistle here, you mean I have to submit to the Lord's word through Paul? No. I will keep doing what I'm doing. I will keep saying what I'm saying. I won't abandon my false teaching, my feelings, emotions. Hmm. It's the charismatic movement, that's what 1 Corinthians is all about anyway. Spiritual gift abuses. Paul says, okay, I anticipate an objection. In the case of those who don't want to acknowledge the commandments of the Lord through me, those people are ignorant and you leave them in their ignorance. Leave them in their darkness. And those are believers, believers, believers. Some Christians, uh, I will say, a great many Christians, they are fervent, they truly love the Lord, but they're in ignorance. And no matter how zealous they are, they're like a Paulus. They need more study before they can go around and do the work of the ministry. They don't know enough to teach anyone anything of any substance. What they've studied is denominational systems. They haven't looked at the grace message and the doctrines of grace, Romans to Philemon. They don't know the revelation of the mystery, but they know everything else. I used to be like that in ministry. I was the blind leading the blind too. See? Hopefully I'm not anymore. <laughs> they just need to be taught the truth. They'll accept the truth. They just need to be taught it. That was me. That was me. See? Then you have the others who are ignorant and comfortable where they are. I will not change religions. I will not leave my denominational system. No, 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 no. I will keep my modern English version. I will retain my scholarship, my prestigious degrees, my connections with prestigious universities. See? On and on and on. Men pleasing Frankly, some in ministry know they're serving the devil, the world, and the flesh. And no amount of teaching or discussion will reform them. Leave them alone, Titus 3. Reject the heretic after the first and second admonitions. Hmm. You can't share the truth with them because they already know it. And they are deliberately living contrary to it, thinking opposed to it. Free will, leave them alone. Acts 18. Now that Apollos is a mature believer, Verse 27, and when he was disposed, he chose to pass into Achaia, or Achaia. Achaia, see, now Apollos was in Ephesus, see here, Aquila, Priscilla, Apollos here in Ephesus. 
Apollos intended to pass through Achaia, Achaia, the southern Greece, uh, Corinth, Athens, Sincrea. Uh, see, now he's following up where Paul was in chapter 17 and into chapter 18. Acts 18, 27. The brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him, who when he was come helped them much, which had believed through grace. For he mightily convinced the Jews and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. Apollos has some recommendations, some letters of recommendation. The brethren approve his ministry and they encourage the other believers, receive Apollos. See, he's gaining a reputation, a good reputation. Some of these letters here, such as Romans 16, look, Romans 16 verse 1. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the church, which is at Sincrea. Now that's south of Corinth. That is the southern port of Corinth. That ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succor, a helper of many, and of myself also. Look, and then Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers. Okay, the, the letters connected to Apollos there, that would be something like what Paul wrote about Phoebe here, this Christian woman, in Romans 16. Another passage, 1 Corinthians 16, 10. 1 Corinthians 16, 10. Now if Timotheus come, see that he may be with you without fear, for he worketh the work of the Lord as I also do. See? Phoebe is commended. Timotheus, Timothy is commended. One more, Colossians 4, verse 10. Colossians 4, 10. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, saluteth you, and Marcus, sister, son to Barnabas, touching whom ye receive commandments. If he come unto you, receive him. See? Well, that was written about Apollos. The brethren circulating these letters of commendation or messages of commendation. Acts 18, 27 exhorting the brethren, encouraging the brethren, urging the brethren to receive him who when he was come helped them much which had believed through grace. After Apollos was taught the dispensationally delivered scripture, then he could help others. And as we read already in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, Paul had a ministry in Corinth first, then Apollos followed. And Apollos was a teacher in Corinth after Paul visited and won them the Christ. Apollos strengthened them because of what he learned from Aquila and Priscilla, see? And they had learned it from Paul. Apollos helped them much. 27, which had believed through grace. Believed through grace. See? Grace. Paul's ministry. 28, for he, Apollos, mightily convinced the Jews. See? He's engaged in public Bible teaching. He's using the Old Testament scriptures, just like Paul, Acts 17, 2 and 3, Acts 18, 5, to prove to them See, Acts 18, 28, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ, Messiah. He didn't preach that before. He knew only the baptism of John, verse 25. Now he knows about Jesus Christ. See, Jesus is Christ. And once they come to terms with that, then he can tell them Christ rejected there 
of Israel died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day. Just like Paul would do. So, Apollos is rightly dividing the word of truth now. He knows the message of grace. He is aware of God's current dealings with man. He grew up in the scriptures. And he is now able to help Paul in his ministry. It not that awesome to wind up with such error at the beginning and at the end of this chapter, Apollos is a mighty vessel of the Lord. He's up to date. He knows the current revelation from God. He's not stuck in time past like Christendom is now. Mm. Apollos mightily convinced the Jews He's more fervent than ever. We will close with Philippians 3. We are finished with Acts 18. I want to close with Philippians 3. Let me read the chapter first. And I will make some light commentary as we go. Light. Philippians 3 verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me indeed is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision for we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Watch out for the Judaizers, the denominationists, the works religionists. Be careful, I warn you. In love, I warn you in love. Be careful, watch out. The, the, the church today has ignored this. They do have confidence in the flesh. Listen, verse 4. Though I, Philippians 3, 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. There was no greater works religionist than Saul of Tarsus. Here is the Apostle Paul's religious resume. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, a religious leader, a strict law-keeping religious leader. Concerning zeal, Zealous, like Apollos, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, everything that the law demanded, I did. Even the animal sacrifices, when I didn't live up to the law. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ, and be found in Him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, 
self-righteousness, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know Him in the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being made conformable unto His death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect. But I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. <laughs> Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing, Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. For many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who mind earthly things. For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile body that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body, according to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. The point is, Philippians 3, Paul used to be a works religionist, a lost man on his way to a devil's hell forever. Religious, pious, devout, Self-righteous, I did this, I did that, but I was lost as lost can be, could be. One day, it was Acts 9, I stopped relying on self. I'm good enough! No, Acts 9, the Lord showed me in graphic detail, I'm on my way to hell. Religious and lost, religious but lost. I need the Savior like everyone else. I have no confidence in the flesh. Know why? Because I used to, and it got me nowhere, so I gave up with it. And now my righteousness is in Christ. God's righteousness in Christ. And if anyone from denominationalism or Judaism works religion, comes to entice you with a works religion system, you say, no! My Apostle Paul was in that, and it, it was profitless for him, it's profitless for me too. Acts 9, Paul, on his way to hell, God changed his direction, mm -mm, not downward, upward, Paul. And for the rest of Paul's life, now this is, something like 35 years after Acts 9. This is after the book of Acts is finished. This is in the two-year stay Paul had in Rome there, the last two verses of Acts. Paul is writing Philippians. 35 years after becoming a Christian, I, Paul, am still in the process of learning just why the Lord from heaven's glory took me off that path to hell that I was on. I still can't fathom why he saved me unto eternal life, but I'm growing still in that knowledge. I haven't apprehended it yet, but I'm still growing in grace. See? We should be of that persuasion also. Always growing. Never comfortable where we are. I'm saved. I don't want to worry about anything else. I don't worry about doctrine. I don't want to grow up. I just want to be a baby with the gospel. That's it. Oh, what a tragedy. 
It happens a lot, okay? Don't let it happen to you. Don't. What we have learned in grace, we should walk according to it. Okay? Paul is doing that. We should do it. And look, Philippians 3 at the end. Our destiny as members of the church, the body of Christ, in the heavenly places, ruling and reigning with Christ in the ages to come. Using the doctrine we learned on earth. The gold, silver, precious stones at the judgment seat of Christ. The grace doctrine. Ah, so we end Acts 18 with Philippians 3. <laughs> ah, well, yes, that is strange. Hmm. Apollos grew up in the scriptures. Aquila and Priscilla grew up. Paul grew up. They were still growing. We should grow up and continue to grow up too. That's Acts 18. Thank you, Father God. As we move now into Acts 19, bless this time of study. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.